morning. So um, we are on the Church of Laodicea, and I know it's been a while since I recorded a Bible study that um, I prayed for time um, to get through this, and God gave me some time today, obviously. So, okay. So, um, like I said, Church of Laodicea, um, <clears throat> and that starts at um, Revelation 3, verse 14. But we're not going to get there quite yet. So, um, Laodicea was founded in 2000 BC. Um, it's 40 miles south of Philadelphia, and it was named named after Antiochus II's wife um, after he rebuilt it in 250 BC. So, um, in 190 BC, it became part of Pergamos and part of the Roman Empire. So uh, also Josephus uh, records a large uh, Jewish uh, colony there. So um, the economy there um, is important um, to remember So because it ties into everything. So it was a colony of merchants, bankers, and gold refiners. Uh, it sat at the junction of the roads um, leading to Smyrna, in Ephesus, and uh, there was a lot of wealth uh, that flowed through there. So um, they even had a caravan trade as far east as the Yellow River by the China Sea. So uh, it's pretty impressive. Uh, they were uh, had trade as far east as China. So um, an earthquake destroyed it in 62 AD, and it was rebuilt by its citizens. Uh, they were very wealthy. So without help from Rome. So, and I'll tie into that um, pretty quick. So um, I just want to add something. So it's a good note to start out on that um, each of these seven churches, um, the seven letters that um, we're going through, was intended to be read by each of the seven churches. Um, so they were, they were all intended for everyone. So meaning, um, in some sense, um, each one applies to every, everyone, every church. So we can't assume that like a given church is all just Thyatira or all just Smyrna. Um, the more accurate view is that each church has some measure of the seven churches in them, which obviously makes sense. So all of these le seven letters apply to all churches, uh, not just, you know, to themselves. So, um, there's also a lesson for each of us individually, um, no matter what church that we go to, um, they all end with he who has an ear, let him hear. And because it's for all of us, um, not it's for all of us, the reader included. So, so the book of Acts, uh, covers the first 30 years of the church and, uh, most told, uh, uh the book of revelation covers about 2000 years, um, of the succeeding years of that. So, that's why they appear to be in historical order, which is important. So, because they lay it all out, um, they lay out the whole entire history of the church. <clears throat> Just for a recap, um, each of the seven letters has seven de <clears throat> design elements to it. Uh, so, the entire Bible is laid out architecturally by design by the Holy Spirit. We know this. Um, each book anticipates um, events. Uh, before they happen in the next book, so which proves it is written um, outside some by someone outside of time, which is Holy Spirit. So, 66 books uh, written by over 40 authors, but the true author we know, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so, these guys were just listening to Holy Spirit, right? Um, so, this the seven design, design elements of the seven letters. I just want to go through those again. Um, <clears throat> So, um, our one, the name of the church, two, the title, uh, Christ chooses for himself, three, uh, the report card or commendation, four, the concerns for the church, uh, five, the exhortation or what they need to fix, whatever he told them in the concerns, and then, uh, six would be the promise to the overcomer, and seven, uh, is the close with he who has an ear, let him hear. So, um, these all give us, um, basically, uh, what the letter is all about. So, so you remember the last time in Philadelphia, 
Um, they had no bad marks um, in the report card. So he promised to take them out of Trib, right? So I just wanted to do a little recap there uh, to get us back where we started since it took me so long um, to post again. So, okay, back to the study. And then, um, so they were very wealthy. Um, they um, had need of nothing, basically. Um, so they were known for being very prideful, the Laodiceans. All right, so, um, and then uh, prideful uh, in this, pride in this area. Um, so this area was never defendable. Um, it was never defended by the military is what I'm trying to say. So, um, their posture was one of compromise, kind of like our Switzerland, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, but they compromised with everyone. So they really didn't need a, a military to defend them. So not good. Um, so there are things today that testify of their luxury. Okay. Uh, like the gymnasium, uh, theater, baths, and aqueducts. Uh, they had all those things. And, uh, they were well known for their textile uh, manufacturing. And it's worth mentioning because it comes in the letter, the body of the letter. So uh, it was. they were known for a strain of black sheep that had very shiny and soft wool. And they made cloth and carpets from it. So... They also had a famous medical school there known for the ophthalmic ointment. ointment. So um, it was a mixture of oil and colorium powder. So uh, Aristotle called it the Fergan powder, but it was an ISAF. So it was known all over the world, believe it or not. And so this also comes up in Jesus' letter to them. Geographically, uh, Laodicea sat between Heropolis and Colossia. So Heropolis had um, hot springs and Colossia was known for its cold springs. And by that time, by the time the water traveled from Heropolis um, to Laodicea, five or six miles away, it was lukewarm. Okay, so this is significant because Jesus mentions this also in the letter. Um, so lukewarm water is, you know, makes you want to spit it out, basically, and <clears throat> spew out of your mouth. And that's what he says in the letter. So. Um, so Paul wrote a letter to Timothy from Laodicea and it's called Colossians. All right. So Colossia and Laodicea were so close that they were instructed to share circulation letters that Paul wrote them. And the reason was because, um, basically there was pagan mysticism going on at that time. And because there were Gnostic errors that were beginning to make an appearance in this valley. So that's why they were supposed to exchange these letters from Paul um, to try to combat those. So, all right. Um, so, um, tradition says that Archippus, um, had become a bishop of Laodicea. So, uh, 30 years earlier, Paul had warned, uh, Archippus to be more diligent in fulfilling his ministry. That was in Colossians, um, 2, 1 and 4, 16. It may have been Archippus' um, weakness, which controlled um, or which contributed to the spiritual condition of the church there. So uh, some of the things that Paul wrote to the Colossians pertain to Laodicea as well. All right, so Leo uh, means uh, people and Decians means rulers, so ruled by the people. So it uh, suggests almost a democracy of some sort. Okay, so we're going to get started with the letter um, here. So we're looking at Revelation uh, 3.14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So um, Christ chooses uh, this title for himself to Laodicea. And... Um, Jesus, Jesus titles himself um, back to his foundational character is what he's doing. So Amen is actually a Hebrew word. Um, it means true and verily. Um, in 1 Samuel 6 to 5, uh, we see that. And then uh, he is the faithful and true witness. 
Um, we see that in Revelation 1, um, Psalms 89, Isaiah 55. So um, the beginning of the creation of God, um, we read that in there. So uh, meaning of the beginning is first origin, first cause, ruling power, authority, and ruler. So this term is used um, basically of rank and honor. Excuse me. The expression occurs here uh, to Laodicea and also in Colossians 1.15. So the letters to Colossian Laodicea uh, basically, like I said earlier, were rebuttals to the Gnostic heirs that were making their appearance in the um, Licious Valley. Um, so like I mentioned earlier. Um, so basically what we're going to do here is we're going to skip commendations um, for a good reason. And that is because uh, they didn't have any good marks on their report card. <laughs> so they didn't have any commendations. Um, so we're going to just gonna skip over commendations because there's nothing to talk about. And we're going to go to concerns. So um, we're going to read uh, 15 and 16 now. So I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth or spew you out of my mouth. Okay, so, um, like we talked about before, um, the springs, the hot and cold springs, and by the time they got to Laodicea, uh, they were lukewarm, so that's where it ties in, is here. Um, so then, uh, this sounds a lot like rejection. <clears throat> spew you out of my mouth, so... Um, not uh, not a really good thing uh, for the church of Laodicea. Um, <clears throat> so then we'll continue on to 17. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know what that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Uh, harsh, harsh words. Um, so if you guys have ever seen any um, TV ministers, not all. But some TV ministers, the, the name it and claim it guys, um, the ones that say you're sick because you don't have enough faith, um, the, the guys that say that God wants you to be wealthy. Um, so that kind of ties into this here. Um, and all through uh, the seven letters, we see this. So um, it's an example of the perception of the church and it was wrong. So still is wrong. So uh, the, the churches that thought they were doing well in the seven letters, they weren't in the one and vice versa. The ones that thought they weren't doing well really were. So um, wretched, naked, and blind. So, and then we have, uh, we'll continue on to 18 and 19. I counsel you to buy from me gold uh, refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, <clears throat> therefore be zealous and repent. Okay. So you remember the eye salve, they were known for having, um, this eye salve, uh, worldwide. And um, so, like I said, this all, he's using things <clears throat> for them that they can relate to. So, all right. Um, so these are all idioms, um, obviously. So uh, I counsel to buy, you to buy of me the gold tried in fire, obviously not the kind of gold that they were trading, right? And um, it's an idiom. And then uh, be rich in white raiment, another idiom. So, um, these were used as idioms. We'll continue on with that here in just a minute. But so here are the remedies, uh, the remedies proposed for them in this, um, their blindness and nakedness, uh, were not incurable. Uh, the ultimate refiner offers his gold. Okay. And we know who God is the ultimate refiner from Psalm 19, seven through 11, 12, <clears throat> six and first Corinthians three, 12. So God refines us constantly. If you stay in him, we're constantly being refined. So if you see conviction, um, that comes from the Holy spirit and that's a good thing. So, 
the bridegroom, uh, when we talk about raiment and garments, the bridegroom offers his covering, white raiment versus the glossy craven or raven colored black wool that they were known for. So uh, this goes back to the sheep that he was talking, that we mentioned earlier, that they were known for their textile and all that um, because they were merchants. So here he references that. um, He's talking about white raiment that he gives compared to the black wool that they were known for from these sheep that they had. And then obviously uh, the great physician offers a remedy um, to open their eyes and this is about the eye salve that they were known for. So um, if you have, um, we know that the great physician is Holy Spirit. So, um, if you don't have Holy Spirit, you're blind and susceptible to deception. And we see a whole lot of that today. So, um, and we're going to continue on to 20 here. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. So uh, we got the final indictment of um, the church of Laodicea here. So the fact that um, the way he says it here, behold, I stand in the door at knock. He's standing at the door and knocking. So that means he's outside the church of Laodicea. He's not in the church there. So that's significant. Um, Whereas the uh, three first churches, he said he was in the midst of them. So he's outside the church of Laodicea. And uh, this message, obviously, like we talked about earlier, is not just to the church of Laodicea. It's to the individual who hears Christ um, and says, I'm knocking uh, open the door. And this is in spite of the church. So if you hear God's voice, no matter what church you attend, um, This is for everyone. It's for the individual. So if God's knocking at your door, no matter what your church is preaching, and he's telling you something, then come to him. Open the door. So, all right, then we're going to go through 21 and 22 and sum up the scripture here. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So... <clears throat> That's a great promise there. So, um, Christ was promised a throne. Um, he isn't on it yet, obviously. We know this. Um, you see where he says he overcame and sits down with his father on his father's throne. So, Christ was promised David's throne. And uh, we know that promise because it was revealed by Gabriel to Mary when he told her that she was with child. So, he will come back to take possession of this. And we know this is the second coming. So, um, with the promise to the overcomer, I just wanted to note that uh, we know who the overcomer is, and the definition can be found in 1 John 5. So, whoever, uh, for whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even in our faith. Who, who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? So that is a definition for the overcomer that talks about in all of these letters. So, um, so Sardis and Laodicea um, are the two churches that have nothing good said about them. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we have a lot of Sardis and Laodiceas uh, today, uh, and not just in America, but all over. So, um, <clears throat> so then we have... Um, levels of application here. So prophetically, uh, Laodicea is the apostate church. So they compromise with the world for prosperity and riches and royalty. Um, So churches that um, have fallen away from the original faith founded by Jesus, um, churches that don't preach Jesus, uh, there are some that don't, and churches that don't preach about the blood, um, Churches that um, abandon and renounce sound doctrine, uh, which is widely today, uh, a lot of churches, and they embrace opinions uh, contrary to their previous beliefs. That's the definition of an apostate church. So um, they did have sound doctrine at one time, um, but then they renounced it and they started embracing basically liberal 
um, worldly uh, opinions contrary to what their previous um, beliefs and teachings were. So um, <clears throat> that kind of finishes up the chapter, um, but there's something that I want to talk about because there's some correlations here um, to the seven kingdom parables and uh, Paul's epistles uh, with these letters. So and we'll just kind of finish up uh, the churches with this. So uh, Matthew 13 uh, talks about the seven kingdom par parables, and uh, we're going to compare those to the churches first. So um, the purpose of parables, uh, Jesus tells them, is not to explain uh, something that they don't understand. It's to make sure they do understand it. So um, when Jesus gives you a little bit of truth, depending on what you do with it, um, he may give you a little more. And if you don't do anything with it, he takes it away. So, um, in chapter 12, uh, when they accused Jesus of his miracles being by Beelzebub, and from that day forward, he spoke in parables only. So, um, the meanings of parables are basically the secrets of the foundation of the world, and you won't find them in the Old Testament, and there's a good reason for that. Um, so Paul reveals in Ephesians 3, the secret is that the Gentiles would be fellow heirs of the same body <clears throat> and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So the secret from the foundation of the world is the church, right? It's a Gentile promise. And so in Isaiah, it talks about, um, it says the Gentiles will be saved. Um, so this is not the mystery um, the mystery is the church becoming heirs and partakers of his promise because the mystery is not found in the Old Testament. It's found in the New. It's a Gentile promise. So, um, so like I said, there uh, seems to be a correlation between the seven churches and the seven kingdom parables, also between the seven churches and Paul's um, epistles. <clears throat> so that leaves, well, Paul wrote 13 epistles. I'll explain this now. He wrote 13 epistles um, because some of them broke up into one and two parts. <clears throat> but three of those epistles uh, were written to Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, or Philemon, however you say it, and they were ministers. And then, um, so at least seven actual churches that um, we're going to correlate with these letters. So, uh, parable one uh, is the parable of the sower and the four soils. Uh, again, you can find these in Matthew 13. So, um, we know that this parable is about the word, uh, getting sown into good ground, fertile soil. So the soil wasn't right. If the soil wasn't right, the seed was gobbled up by the enemy, the birds, uh, prophetically birds are always bad in scripture, always. So, um, so Jesus explained, he explained this one himself. And, uh, when someone hears the word and doesn't understand it, the birds, an idiom, they're an idiom for the wicked one. We know that from Luke, okay? So um, the birds uh, take it away. The, the wicked one takes it away. So Jesus sows the word, um, and the field um, is an idiom for the world also, so always. So in Ephesus, um, they focused more on rules and limitations um, than actual devotion to Christ. And so their hearts had become calloused, um, Therefore, even in hearing the word, they weren't getting um, the real significance of it. So their hearts or your inner mind, your heart, um, they might have heard it, um, but there was no real acceptance going on, no understanding. So like Isaiah said, uh, hearing you will hear and shall not understand and seeing you will see and not perceive lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, then they should understand with their hearts so that I should heal them. Okay, so the seed wasn't falling on good soil in Ephesus, um, and their hearts were calloused um, to understand. So Ephesus lines up with the parable of the sower and the four soils. So then um, there's the parable of the tares, and this is the second one. So you have the parable of the tares and, and the wheat. And the sower um, plants good seed. While he's asleep, the enemy sows tares with them. And the sower didn't pull the tares immediately because some of the wheat would get uprooted with it also. So um, they will grow together until the harvest. Then they will be separated. Uh, the tares go into the fire and the wheat uh, goes into the barn. 
So this obviously has to do with the churches. So not every church is true. Some are sown by the enemy to grow up looking like they're wheat, but they're actually tares. So looks like wheat, um, but it really isn't. And so when the harvest is ripe, um, the pit is where they will go, um, the tares. So some teach uh, contrary to what the Bible teaches. Excuse me. And um, they take a very liberal stance and they preach non-biblical things to be okay. Um, and some are just downright evil and uh, they call themselves things that they're not, like Jews, for example. They condone anti-Semitism and hate of other races. Um, these are evil churches, tares. So the people who teach these things are um, at harvest time will be gathered up and thrown into the pit. Um, so you remember Smyrna um, was the persecuted church, and Jesus said that he knows the slander um, of their church um, and those who say they are Jews but are not. So Smyrna is the wheat growing up with the tares, um, the churches and the leaders planted by the enemy. Um, so in, uh, they're going to be stay that way until the harvest. And so Smyrna um, lines up with the tares in the wheat parable. And then we have, um, also, if you remember, Smyrna had really heavy satanic opposition. So um, these are churches that have heavy satanic opposition um, fighting or coming up against um, liberal uh, compromising churches um, that don't stand, stand for sound doctrine anymore. So and we have Pergamos. Um, they were they were spiritually were compromised. This lines up with the mustard seed parable. So it grows so big and grotesque that it allows the birds of the air to lodge on the branches. Here we have birds again. The enemy is lodging in the branches of this um, big establishment, this church. So the mustard seed is naturally a smaller plant. Um, it's usually like three feet tall. Um, <clears throat> um, that this one had grown very large and was collaborating with the wicked one, the birds, the enemy. So um, if you're interested, um, just something worth mentioning here. Um, there's something called the World Council of Churches. It's a combo of um, the Reformation and uh, denominational churches, and they are worldwide. So they're very, very political, and they've been caught using funds... Um, for communist parties and their membership is huge so uh, check that out on your own if you want to okay and then we have Thyatira uh, the corrupt church and uh, and that compares to the parable of the woman um, in the leaven parable where she sews it into the bread so uh, this is all about introducing false doctrine um, leaven always in the Bible is an idiom for sin it corrupts by puffing up like pride and infiltrates the whole loaf um, like pride puffs up. So God does not like pride. Um, uh, and if you're a Jew and you were hearing this parable, um, this would be huge. Um, this would be just awful because for a Jew, um, this would have been a really major offense. Um, when we read it, we don't really catch the significance of it. Yeah, it's bad. But for a Jew, this was really bad. So she hid the leaven in the fellowship offering and no leaven was allowed in the fellowship offering. Um, and we know it was the fellowship offering because she used three measures of meal. So three measures, measures of meal started, um, when the Lord and his two angels visited Abraham by the Oak, Oaks of Mamre. So that's where the three measures of meal started and that's the fellowship offering. So, if you're Jewish and you're hearing this parable, you know that because she used three measures of meal, this was the fellowship offering that she was um, putting leaven in, <clears throat> which was not allowed. So this was, this was huge. It would, they would have been appalled. <clears throat> okay. Um, so Thyatira um, compares to the woman uh, in the leaven parable. And next we have Sardis, and we know that Sardis only had, uh, they had a name only, they were a dead church, <clears throat> and it lines up with the treasure in the field. Now, if you read the treasure in the field parable, you might think that it sounds good, but you have to remember that the field always, uh, prophetically, is uh, the world. So, 
he gave all that he had uh, for worldly things. So uh, the treasure in the field, the field is the world, and within it a treasure is hidden. Um, the man that buys the field is not a believer. He has not found Christ. The treasure that was hidden was so precious he gave all that he had to buy it. So in another sense, Christ is the buyer. We are the hidden treasure. Um, but remember um, that this really wasn't... Uh, a good thing so um except for that part so there's kind of two parts to this one but sardis uh lines up with the guy who gave all he had for the world right so they were the dead church and then we've got the good church philadelphia the one that um everyone always wants to be so and they are compared to the parable of um the pearl of great price so they are the faithful church. And so um, the pearl of great price. So the pearls, oysters are not kosher. Okay. So this is significant because this does not pertain to Jews. Jews don't price pearls. Uh, it's a Gentile idiom. So the pearls are unique among the jewels because it's a response to irritation, basically. And then um, it's removed and it's prized, it's a prized jewel after that um, from its place of growth. So it's an idiom for the Gentile church um, because Jews don't even refer to it as being anything of great importance. So, all right. And then uh, last but not least, we have Laodicea. Uh, Laodicea is compared to the dragnet um, parable. So it is the final cleanup. Um, and it's where at the end of the world, uh, the angels, uh, sever the wicked from the just. So Laodicea, um, were wicked, still are wicked, and they compromise with the world for prosperity. Um, and they could be also known as the liberal or apostate church. All right. So that, um, sums up the, um, seven kingdom parables with the seven letters to the church. And now we're going to compare uh, Paul's epistles, which I already explained how we got seven churches out of those. Um, and with the seven letters to the church. Okay. So <clears throat> Jesus's letters compared to Paul's epistles. So um, Jesus wrote to Ephesus, right? Our first church. And their um, thing was to remember your first love. And Paul wrote to Ephesus as well. Um, and Ephesus, Paul writes uh, basically love for God and spiritual knowledge. <clears throat> and then we have Smyrna. Um, Jesus writes to Smyrna, the persecuted church and suffering. And that compares to uh, Philippians and, and Paul's writings, joy through suffering. Um, and then we have Pergamos. Um, married to the world, and that correlates to uh, Corinthians, the first and second Corinthians, the worldly church. Uh, that's what Paul writes about. And then you got Thyatira, call out of idolism, and then that uh, correlates to Galatians. Um, and Paul's writings, the call out of religious externalism, same thing, right? So then you have Sardis, um, the dead church. And then Romans uh, correlates to Romans and Paul's writings and uh, Romans is all about what we believe and how to live it. Um, and then Philadelphia, obviously the raptured church, they're saved um, from tribulation, correlates with Thessalonians, and we know all know Thessalonians is all tailored to uh, about the rapture. And then uh, Laodicea, um, and they were basically the same thing. They had the same letters as uh, Colossians. They were five miles from each other. Um, in the same neighborhood, right? So, all right, that wraps up um, chapter three. Um, we know that the author of all these things, obviously, because they compare um, to each other, is the Holy Spirit. He authored the whole entire Bible. And um, so, after chapter three, uh, we'll talk about this next time, but that takes us into chapter four. And after chapter three, you see that the church is no longer here. They are in the throne room, throne room of heaven. <clears throat> so um, rapture after this chapter. Um, and then we'll get into chapter four, um, where the church is in the throne room of heaven and they are no longer on earth. All right. So we'll see you next time.